Welcome to the Vanarama National League Highlight Show. Plenty of action ahead in the next half an hour, but also for the next three years. As right, we're delighted to announce that BT Sport will continue to be the exclusive home of National League football until 2021. So you'll keep getting more of this. Great ball, and the header's in. The personal goal is to get back in the Football League as soon as possible. If someone had said to me before, like, you're going to start managing at sort of 27, and when you're 67, you're still managing, you go, well, I'm not sure about that. Everyone uh, loves him as a manager. On the good days, he's like your big brother, and on the bad days, he's like a bad dad. Coming up, free-flowing Fylde hits seven as their remarkable rise continues. Anything you can do, we can do too. Gateshead hand out a hammering of their own. And there's no let up from the league's top two in the battle for automatic promotion. We begin in Lancashire, where back in 2007, AFC Fylde, then known as Kirkham and Wesham FC, were starting out life in the Northwest Counties League. Five promotions and a multi-million pound ground later, the Coasters are now on the verge of the National League playoffs, looking to fulfil their 15-year plan to reach the Football League, four years ahead of schedule. Well, a 15-year plan doesn't guarantee you anything. It's a plan, uh, but it, it helps everybody buy into it, and, and it gives everybody hopefully a clear, you know, a clear direction, something, uh, you know, that we plan to achieve every year. We gave ourselves five years uh, to, to get out of this league. It's our first year. Um, that would take us to 2022, which, uh, as you know, we famously put on our shirt sleeves 10 years ago, and, uh, and people laughed at us. Uh, I don't think there's too many laughing now. And what would promotion mean to the club? It would be a pinch yourself moment, really, I think, for most people associated, myself included. Um, we've been able to, to fund this football club going forward through my normal business. Uh, but mainly it's about the fact that, you know, you're in the real football league and that would be uh, that would be some day for, for us. And, and to do it maybe four years ahead of plan, it would be great as well. There were high expectations as the division's two leading scorers went head-to-head -head at Mill Farm. Fylde, who'd previously put five past Tranmere and six past league leaders Macclesfield, welcomed third-placed Aldershot, who were unbeaten in their last nine on the road. It took just 120 seconds for the league's top scorer to get things going. Danny Rowe opening the floodgates with the first goal of the afternoon. It was a sign of what was to come as three minutes later the visitors equalised. Josh McCoy with his first goal for Aldershot since signing in January. But it turned out to be their only response as the coasters went on the rampage. Sam Finlay putting them back in control, rifling his shot into the top corner from 25 yards. The goals were coming thick and fast and Rowe was the star man first heading in across from Jack Muldoon before netting his third seconds after the restart. A perfect hat-trick and his first at this level completed inside 20 minutes, extending his lead in the race for the golden boot. Fans then had to wait almost half an hour for the next goal, the longest drought all game. Simon Grand adding his name to the score sheet with his first since October to give Dave Challoner's side a 5-1 lead at the break. Aldershot came into the game unbeaten in three, but this one was already beyond them as the host continued to pile on the misery. Finley grabbing his second of the game, but his celebrations earned him a second yellow too. But it didn't do anything to stop Fylde's charge, even when Lewis Kinsella brought down Luke Burke. Muldoon was able to supply the seventh and last to complete the route. Fylde have now scored seven more goals than any other club and sit just two points outside the playoffs. Looked at today, obviously hoping to win the game. We, we kind of need to get some wins on the board to kind of get towards the playoffs. I'd, I'd never thought we'd, we'd have won 7-1 here today. An open game, as I, as I thought it would be, because both sides play in a, in a similar way, they like to be expansive um, and sometimes that can be, like I say, to your, to your detriment I, I suppose these type of games, especially um, against teams like Aldershot or 
a little bit who's more clinical at the, at the top end of the pitch, and we were, we were certainly that. No, um, I've never, never scored one uh, in, in the first half of a game before. Apart from last year, I've not scored too many hat-tricks myself. Um, but obviously, it was, it was good to uh, get it done in the first half and put the game to bed. It's all right coming here and beating teams like Aldershot, Macclesfield, um, Tram, Tram Merge, you know, like the teams that are above us. Uh, but we, we need to kind of do, the, do it in the other games as well against the teams towards the bottom of the table and be more consistent. And then if we was to do that, we'd be in the playoffs anyway. Mid-table Gateshead and Maidenhead United clashed in the northeast in November last year. The hosts beat their Berkshire rivals 3-0 away. This fixture at the Gateshead International Stadium was barely 20 minutes old when Richard Pennicott arrived at the far post to score a sixth of the campaign. Moments later, though, a scramble in the box at the other end. The move ended with James Montgomery beaten by the head of Jake Hyde, one all. The reigning National League South champions were back in the clash for barely a couple of minutes after failing to clear a corner. Jamal Fifield pounced for Steve Watson's men. After three goals in less than 30 minutes, it took until the hour mark for another. Gateshead's advantage improved at the end of a stylish move thanks to Danny Johnson, 3-1. There was then a burst of three goals in only five minutes. From a Paddy McLaughlin corner, Johnson once again got the better of Carl Pentney. Next came a poor back pass from Max Kilman. Johnson helped himself to a hat-trick. These three goals were his first for Gateshead since the previous fixture against their struggling opposition. Then to make it 6-1, really neat passing from Watson's side, finished off in style by McLaughlin, for him a second of the season. Unbelievably, there was still time for another, a further goal at Pentney's far post. Sub Jordan Burrow got in on the act on 90 minutes. Gateshead had scored only seven in their previous seven home games. In the first half, I didn't feel as I was going to score today. I just had that feeling, but come out, Reese has pulled one back and I've tapped it in and they're the, they're the goals you dream of. Um, the second one slapped off my knee and went in, but sometimes during the season, I've said I haven't had that look, but you've seen today, I've had that look every every single bit and the, the defenders played a back pass, read it. And put for the keeps legs. You delight the win. You delight the win well. Um, you know, but uh, some of the goals and some of the finishing was, was just was, was great to watch. You know, some of the some of the one twos and some some of the speed of, of play near the end um, was was all you know, was what you work all week to try and achieve. There's been plenty of games where we've had chances and not put them away, and, and you know, a big a big win like that's probably been coming since I've been here. So it's nice it's nice to get that goal difference up up as well because it's already good. But um, you know, it's, it's up and around the top teams now. Top of the National League table, unbeaten in five games and boasting the player of the month in Elliot Durrell. Macclesfield have a lot to be pleased about at the moment. A two-point cushion separated them from Sutton, whilst visitors Barrow had the same narrow advantage between themselves and the relegation zone. So three points important for both. It was Aidy Pennock's side who made the first bid for them. Luke James on loan from Forest Green, scoring his third goal in three games to put Barrow in front against the league leaders. The early setback was rectified by the Silkman before the break. Mitch Hancock's with his sixth goal of the season, levelling things up with a drive from 25 yards out. The Bluebirds were on their way to picking up a point at Moss Rose and extending their unbeaten run to four games. That was until Hancock's was brought down in the box. Danny Whittaker stepped up to the spot and beat Steve Arnold to give Macclesfield the lead with 20 minutes to play. Moments later, John Askey's star man Durrell sealed the win, the midfielder scoring his seventh of the campaign. The victory means Macclesfield have already accumulated more points than last season, with 10 games still to play. We could have scored more. There was a lot of chances. Um, um, you know, we should have should have uh, taken taken more of the chances that we created, but but we didn't. But uh, if you'd have said before the game that we we're going to win 3-1, then uh, then I'd be more than happy. We're obviously disappointed we've lost. Um, you know, but I thought we took the lead and was on the front foot. And um, you know, at one all we had we had a, a good chance to take the lead and, and we failed. And I think the difference today was in the key areas. Macclesfield took their chances and we didn't and paid the price for it. 
There was a meeting of form teams in southwest London with Sutton United looking for a fourth win in a row to maintain the pressure on leaders Macclesfield. Solihull Moors, meanwhile, had seemed like relegation certainties back in December, yet a recent resurgence has given them genuine hope of survival. Victory would be enough to lift them out of the bottom four. Pressure from Paul Doswell's men was rewarded in the first half as from a corner Tom Bollerinwa made it two goals in two matches. Sutton defeated Woking 2-0 in midweek and continued to dominate after the break. Solihull's chances of an equaliser were hit when Adi Youssef was shown a second yellow card for deliberately handling in the box. 1-0 it finished, four wins in a row now is Sutton's best run since returning to the National League. I thought there was nothing in it, to be fair. Um, I thought we were a better team first half. Just when we had a couple of good opportunities, we didn't, didn't do as well as we could have done. Um, you know when you come here, you know you're going to be under pressure, you know you're going to deal with set pieces and balls in your box. And, and unfortunately, we didn't, we didn't do our jobs as well as we would have liked. From the south of London to the east, where Dagenham welcomed Tranmere. Both teams were looking for back-to-back -back league wins and after a goalless first half, it was Rovers who broke the deadlock. The run from Connor Jennings down the left with Andy Cook allowed to score his 16th goal of the season. It kick-started what would become Tranmere's biggest away win for over four years, led by their two frontmen. James Norwood netting his 14th goal to give Rovers a 2-0 lead. And seconds after the restart, Cook had bagged his brace. He's now contributed seven goals in the last eight games. The pair, who'd scored 31 goals between them for Rovers, worked together for the fourth and final one of the game just before the whistle. Cook heading on for Norwood, who clinched his second to surpass his tally from last season. Defeat for Dagenham means they've now lost six of the last eight games. First half, I thought we, we missed two open goals. I think two headers should have put us in front. Uh, second half, and I thought we were better than them, that's my opinion. Second half, they were better than us. We came out on the right side of a, of a very good win at a very difficult place. Our finishing was clinical and we're grateful for that. But we got what we knew we were going to get and that was a difficult game and we're just uh, thankful that we, uh, we, we got the three points. One town, one city, two countries. The one they desperately don't want to lose. And it's gone in the back of the net. Brilliant. Really? Touch on the way and in. Would you believe it? Oh, it's a moment of real quality. Border Derby is always a passionate affair, but this meeting carried extra significance. Wrexham needed a win to keep their automatic promotion dreams alive, whilst Chester came in six points from safety with time running out. Watching this one for us were the two Adams, Virgo and Somerton. Devinix with the touch, quickly. He's got Carrington on the outside, he'll go alone, and he'll score! Hit it across the goalkeeper, you give yourself every opportunity. Quickly. The score of the only goal so far. Cleared by Astors, came as far as Holroyd. And Devedix on the turn. What a lovely finish that was. Nicky Devedix with his first Wrexham goal. Whether this is offside or not, I was mentioning the areas that maybe the two holding midfielders are just dropping a tiny bit deep. Holroyd oh picks up a great position, and it's a good decision from the linesman. Clearly see the number two Andy Halls there, playing him on side. And it's a quality finish from Nicky Devinix. We're delighted with it. We've uh, set the club's new record to have 20 clean sheets in the season, and obviously to do that against your, uh, your bit of rivals, and yeah, it sends, it sends everybody on happy. So, first thing, game's unbeaten now. Where do you feel like that leaves you in your bid for automatic promotion? Yeah, well, we needed three points, obviously. Had, uh, pre before the game, we were 12 unbeaten, um, eight draws. So, obviously, uh, too many draws in there. And, uh, obviously, we're delighted you now. Obviously, it sends everybody on happy. But we've got a big game ready uh, to get ready for now, down at Welkin next week. 
precious points that could prevent relegation were on the line at the Gallagher Stadium. Maidstone United hadn't won in 17 the last time they secured victory was against Torquay United back in November. Just after the hour mark, the visitors had a big opportunity to take the lead in Kent and Elliot Roman Cross made its way to Connor Lehman High Evans, who was denied by Lee Worgan. Maidstone had lost their last four at home with two minutes to play. A header from Ross Lafayette hit the post, but right back Josh Hare was in the right place. A late victory for Jay Saunders' men who complete the double over Torquay this season. There's a lot of pressure on us today. I think there's a lot of um, the players, like the feel there was a little bit of tension before the game. It's the quietest the change has been for a little while. And I feel that even when the game started, I think the whole crowd was so quiet. I think it was just that, oh no, are we, we going to do it? So um, you can hear the relief at the end of the game. It wasn't a great performance, but, um, but listen, the three points all that mattered. Things have been going from bad to worse this season for Hartlepool United, with one win in 14 games putting them in serious danger of successive relegations. But off the pitch, the club's future is still in peril too, despite recent news of a takeover bid from a local consortium. The window of opportunity to save the pools is shrinking. We've got a leading local businessman that's trying to put a consortium together and, um, you know, Jess Stelling's involved in that and they've been trying to appeal for more potential investors to come forward and join in with them. We're hoping to raise 250000 um, We know the shortfall is 600, but we have to look at a sensible figure first. And if we get to that and we can push on, that would be great. We are genuinely running out of time and, you know, without the support that we've had from the fans, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be playing here today. You know, it is getting quite close, really. Hartlepool needs a football club and, you know, I'm, I'm doing all I can to keep it in the, in, you know, in the fashion that it's currently in. We've got to stay in this league. That's why we're pushing for the fans to get behind it and local businesses to make sure we get enough money so we don't go to administration. If we go to administration, those 10 points will kill us. It'll drop us a league. After back-to-back -back defeats to begin his second caretaker spell, Paul's boss Matty Bates faced another tough task against a Borehamwood side firmly in the playoff hunt, having dropped just two points from their last five matches. The host came close to breaking the deadlock just before half-time. Michael Woods with an effort saved by Grant Smith. Connor Newton denied by the woodwork on the rebound. The look didn't change in the second half. Hartlepool forced to play the final 25 minutes with 10 men when defender Scott Harrison was judged to have pulled back Morgan Ferrier and shown a second yellow card. Wood haven't lost an away game since September and they came close to breaking Hartlepool hearts when Angelo Balanta fired against the post in the dying moments. A crucial point for the hosts, but Bates was realistic about his prospects of a permanent appointment. All I can do is do the best with the football club. I do that every, every day I'm working. Um, and I think you can see from the lads' performance today that you know, they're behind me and um, long may that continue. Bottom of the division, Geisley were away to Bromley, who had lost only one of their previous nine in all competitions. All key action took place within the last 20 minutes in London, with the match opening up after the visitors' Victor Niranold was sent off. A second yellow was given after a foul on George Porter. Geisley's Luke Coddington was doing his best to claim a clean sheet at Hayes Lane, but Josh Rees wanted all three points, finding the net for the 13th time this season, making him Bromley's joint top scorer. By the 88th minute, the clash was seemingly decided, but on the day that one Rooney Wayne missed a penalty at Goodison Park, another John let fly from the edge of the area, scoring a fifth of the campaign. Sean St. Ledger's ten men had moments to go before the whistle, but after a couple of lost challenges in midfield, sub Omar Bagheel clinched victory. Bromley's first win in four in the league keeps them close to the playoffs.
More than 4,000 fans packed the Matchroom Stadium, hoping to see Leighton Orient's first league win at home this year. But Ebbsfleet were on their best ever run in the fifth tier, having won their last four games. And they took the lead here on the quarter hour mark. Corey Whiteley rolling his defender before firing past Dean Brill to score his second goal for the club. Now out of the FA Trophy, Orient are firmly focused on the league and they drew level when James Brophy's cross was inadvertently turned in by defender Dave Winfield. The draw means Ed's fleet are now four points off the playoffs, much to the delight of manager of the month, Daryl McMahon. It's the walk of the staff and the players. It's, uh, I'll get the award, but it's for everyone at the club. I think everyone's worked hard in, in the last four or five games and, and um, the players are there as much as anyone else. So what are your ambitions for the rest of the season? Try and finish as high as we can. I think... Um, we sort of looked at it and thought we can get into the top 10 in our fourth season in this league, it'd be a great achievement. And we'll see where it takes us, that's what we're going to try and do. A fortnight ago, Woking's Damon Lathrope suffered an awful leg break against Boreham Wood, which has since forced him to retire from football. Aged only 28, a collection for the midfielder this weekend in Surrey attracted generous donations from supporters of Woking and FC Halifax. The hosts were going for an eighth game unbeaten against their Yorkshire opponents and both clubs are certainly not out of contention to drop out of England's fifth tier. With half an hour gone, Matt Coslow started a move from halfway, driving at the Woking back line, but after being halted by Kane Ferdinand, secured a penalty. The spot kick winner stepped up, making it 1-0. Five minutes after the interval came an equaliser at the Laithwaite Community Stadium. An effort from outside of the box by Regan Charles Cook was diverted past Sam Johnson by Charlie Carter, now woking top scorer with nine for the campaign. 20 minutes later, though, dominant Halifax pressure paid off. Once again, Nathan Baxter was beaten by Coslow, who's on to eight for the season for the Shea Men. Into the final ten, Jamie Fullerton's men weren't shy, pushing for more. A Michael Duckworth cross found sub Connor Thompson, who scored on his debut. Halifax are unbeaten in three, their best run since October. The win gives Halifax some breathing room and Maidstone too will be feeling much more comfortable after their first victory in four months. Hartlepool continue to look nervously over their shoulders despite a hard-fought point, but none of the bottom four were able to enhance their bids for survival. At the top, Macclesfield stay two points clear of Sutton as both maintain their winning streaks, with Tranmere and Wrexham also keeping pace. Meanwhile, with Dover's game at Eastley postponed due to a waterlogged pitch, Fylde's resounding victory moves them within two points of a playoff place. BT Sports live coverage of the Vanarama National League continues on Wednesday the 21st of March with a huge game in the relegation battle as Barrow and Hartlepool square off at Holker Street. We're live from 7.30 on BT Sport 1 and on our 4K UHD channel. We leave you this week with hat-trick hero Danny Rowe who moved five goals clear as the league's top scorer by helping Fylde hand out another thrashing at Mill Farm. The 25-year-old has now scored an incredible seven league hat-tricks for the Coasters in just three and a half years. We'll see you next time.